About two weeks ago, I was in Las Vegas, waiting in line to get into a convention with my good friend, Jason. I looked around the crowd, uh, to the crowd, and they were all young people. And I bet you that 90% of them were under the age of 35. Suddenly, there was a noise, and I looked up, and there was this red balloon coming towards me. And I went over to reach to hit it, and then Jason pulls me back. He says, Tony, don't touch it. It's a trick. What? A trick? Look, this hacker convention is anonymous for a reason. It's a gold mine for the best hackers in the world. And since you and I are in cybersecurity, they want to identify us too because we're persons of interest. You touch that balloon and they have your fingerprints. They have your fingerprints. All these contests, all the money, all the, the live demonstrations, they're there to identify the best hackers in the world. And you can't identify the good guys from the bad guys, the white hats from the black hats. Don't trust anyone. Welcome to the Wild West of hacking. <laughs> If you can't identify the good guys from the bad guys, are all hackers criminals? Are all hackers criminals? You know, that's a real dilemma because we need the white hats protecting us from the black hats. Who else is going to do it? But if they all look the same, I mean, they do because they look like somebody that you would see in a local coffee shop. They all look the same. So. We went our way to the lecture halls, and I'm anxious to get there because there's some exciting topics. And then my friend Jason, he started pointing out the different hackers. Russian, feds, Chinese national, Iranian, the Mossad. You get the point. But the ones that interested me, you know the ones that interested me? Were the ones that were wearing backpacks because they were there to intentionally steal an unprotected cell phone signal, crack into a computer or a tablet. You could see their antennas just coming out of their packs. They were very courageous and brave. They didn't care. They knew somebody there would not protect their stuff. We finally got to the lecture hall, and this was a how to do things. They really shared information. The first class, how to remotely control an airliner. Think about it. This was a perfect example of how we're moving from the physical world to the cyber world. Because in the physical world, we know, how, you know, we know what's happening. We've been there before. You go down to the airport to get on your flight. What do you do? You take off your shoes. You take out all your money. You take off your belt. And then you go through the scanner. And hopefully that scanner will not beep because then they're going to pat you down. The next class even made more sense to me. It was how to overthrow a government. Really, how to overthrow a government. Now, it shouldn't surprise me because the fact of the matter is we see it every day on TV. Everybody's tweeting, twexing, and organizing people through social media. This is not a surprise. But what was really different about this presentation, they were actually going to teach you how to build a cyber mercenary team to be more efficient and practical. <laughs> then my favorite subject, my favorite subject came out next. Weaponizing data science for social engineering. Wow, sounds pretty interesting. Well, when I first started working with programmers, we weren't concerned about human behavior. We weren't concerned, concerned about using, uh, making things easy for the user. All we did is we went from point A to point B, and at that time, you know, it was, you know, control C, control D, control S. It was just that simple. Now, you have a whole team of people surrounding those programmers. 
And they're looking and researching, and they're talking to people, anybody that can fog a mirror, they want to find out what they're thinking. And then they put all that stuff together, and they design it, and then they tell the programmer, this is what you need to do to have a good program. This is what you need to do so we can sell our products. It's all about the money. And the game is really big. By 2020, the industry, the technical industry, expects to sell 2 billion, correction, 20 billion Internet of Things. 20 billion Internet of Things. Now, what are those? Those are those convenient items that will allow you to control your life, set your room temperature, uh, look at your security cameras from home, but through a remote control device called the smartphone. And more and more of those are coming aboard. Smartphone. You know, it's interesting when I look at that because we know that these hackers are going to look and, and take advantage of the situation. They know the weaknesses already. They're ready to rip off everybody that's out there using a smartphone to control these devices. Why? It's really easy. If you think about it, what do you need to do? If you know that you have to connect one of these devices to a smartphone, okay, okay, you, what is a smartphone? Well, a smartphone is nothing but a radio signal that's encased in plastic. And if you're a hacker, what do you want to do with that radio signal? You want to capture it. You want to control it. And then you want to manipulate it to do anything that you want. Then the next step is social engineering. And what is social engineering? Social engineering is the psycho psychological manipulation of people so that they will take action and give you information. Combine those two things. The radio signal. Somebody is going to give you everything that you need to know. And you have a very powerful weapon as a hacker. And the worst thing about it, we're making it easy for them. Let me give you an example. How many of you have ever heard of someone that says, I have my whole life on my cell phone? If a hacker hears that, he says, wow, you know, I hit the gold mine. I love this person. I love this person because they're making it easy. All I have to do is grab that cell phone and all the information and intercede myself into their radio signals, and I can listen to everything. I know their friends. I know where they work. I know their family. I know their bank account. I know everything. Why? Their entire life is in that smartphone, and all I have to do is just tap into it. Social engineering. But the program didn't stop there. They had these villages that we could visit at night. And the villages were really hands-on applications on how do you do things. The, the first one was biohacking. Now, I know some of us have heard about that, that we're going to be using our fingerprints, and we're going to scan our eyes, and we're going to use facial recognition to help protect ourselves in the internet. You know, it's valid to a point. But these hackers are ahead of us. You go to these classes and they're showing other hackers, here's how you break this code, here's how you break this code. There was one guy there that took a picture of somebody's hand from 100 yards away, replicated his fingerprints, and went over and opened his phone. <laughs> these guys are ahead of the game and they know how we're thinking and we know where technology is going. Car hacking. Wow, this one is kind of like fun. <laughs> Everybody is talking about a car being a computer on wheels in the future. And we're talking about driverless cars. But think about the computer and what we started out with. A computer uses radio signals to communicate on the internet, et cetera, and you're going to have it right there on your dashboard. The way I look at it, is that these hackers, <laughs> they're going to have fun with this. I can, believe, I can see it right now. What these hackers are going to do is grab these driverless cars. And maybe they'll have races on the freeway or play bumper cars with them. They're going to have a great time. I can hardly wait to see the headlines. 
social engineering. Yes, there's a, you know, social engineering is everywhere. You know, there was a village on social engineering, but it was really practical. What they did was this. They would bring in these hackers up to this table. On this table, there was a phone, and there was a little script of background information on this business. And their job was to call that business and see how much information somebody was willing to give. In one case, this woman talked to the receptionist, and she asked him, and God, what is the name of this security officer? What's his email address? What's his phone number? And when does he usually show up to work? She gave away a store of information. That's what social engineering is all about. And we don't know how to train our people or have even thought about our training our people on how to handle that kind of information. So after the villages, you know, it really got me thinking. So the next morning, I get up really early. I want to go down to the hacker store and take a look at some of the goodies that are in there. And I didn't go maybe 50 yards. And what did I see? Hacking mom. She was there with her 8-year-old and 11-year-old working on stuff right in front of the social engineering uh, village. And I asked, I looked down, and I see them working on some stuff very busily. And I asked them, well, what are the kids working on? She said, oh, they're just doing encryption puzzles. <laughs> encryption puzzles. Yeah, oh, my 11-year-old just, she loves them. The 8-year-old's having a little hard time. But you know what? She is really persisting, and she's going to figure it out. I just moved on to the hacker store. I get to the hacker store and I was on a hunt. I really wanted to get and see these you know, cell phone frequency jammers. I really wanted to see how they work. Could you really listen in to somebody's phone conversation? And could you really you know, record all the data and the information? Could you do that? So it's a crowded booth. I finally get up to the line, and I'm seeing the choices because I've been living, listening to them as I, was been, as I was walking in line. And then I spotted the portable unit. My God, that was cool. A portable unit to do all that that could fit in the palm of my hand. You could slip it into your pocket. You could wear it on your belt. My God, where has technology gone? Then I started to roam around, and then I saw this sign for $300 C DVD. What's all that about? $300 for a DVD? So I go and look at it, and I find out it's a lead list for hackers. And you know how many leads they got in there for $300? One billion, with a B, and matching passwords. One billion usernames and matching passwords. I left the building, I left the room thinking, wow, <laughs> this is unbelievable. If a person is really motivated and they want to become a black hat, they could do it for less than $10,000 and be on their way. Amazing. So I went home and we had uh, dinner that night and I started asking questions about the contest because the main contest was $3.75 million. The goal was to build a computer that could hack unknown software and plant patches on it with no keyboard. With no keyboard. First prize, $2 million. Second prize, $1 million. Third prize, $750,000. There were about 100 entries. Seven of them, seven made the cut. Now there's seven of these hanging out. I started to think about this. Imagine an artificial intelligent computer that could be disguised as furniture and anything that walks by it gets hacked and plants a virus. Amazing. I finally get home a couple days later and I'm thinking to myself, I'm building scenarios in my head to try to figure how to use all this knowledge, how to use it for a positive point of view to help prevent further cybercrime. Then the idea pops in my head about the lone wolf hacker. Now, we all seen lone wolves, terrorists, they're out there every day in the media causing all kinds of havoc. 
But what's the difference if you're a lone wolf hacker? You still work alone. But the difference is your chances of being caught are de minimis. Why? You don't leave any fingerprints. You don't leave any footprints. You don't leave your DNA anywhere. You're in the cyber world. And you can come back and create more havoc and more havoc. That was a nightmare scenario. But what did I see at the show? I started to see black hats rising. Black hats rising. And I know that cybercrime is growing and it's expected to be $2 trillion by 2020. That's a problem. What are we going to do? How do we protect ourselves? Well, because I'm in the cyber field, I know that every CEO, every board of directors, and all the high technology companies are working really, really hard at solving that problem. But you know who the bright stars are? The bright stars are those two or 300 entrepreneurs that have started startups to crack the password problem. That one is critical because 90% of hacking starts with breaking a person's password. So what do we do now until that is available to us? You have to start changing your password. It is the only defense that you really have today. Now, remember the DVD that I talked about with one billion usernames and passwords? You're probably on that list. But that DVD is, was made at one point in time. That means the matching password is no longer good if you change your password. So go do it. It's a simple defense. Your cell phones, that's, that's the link. So start shutting down your GPSs. I'm not saying don't use it. I'm not saying be a, hum a hermit, but don't turn on your GPS for everything and let it go 24 seven. It's an invitation to a hacker to break into your system. Just an open invitation. And once they do, you're obviously in trouble. So we all have choices. We all have choices. We can either take the time and effort to protect ourselves or not. One last thing, be careful of what you touch. Thank you.